lucky you get two ruckus people in a row. Um, but first off, I have to make sure that I thank everybody in here for voting for my topic so much that you took a 10 talk and made it into an hour. And I'd also like to thank Keith for finding the 45 minute slot to try to get me back down. So um, first off, who's me? Because I have plenty of time to fill and like all the 10 talks. Uh, <laughs> I'm a Wi-Fi person at Ruckus. I have another title, but I don't know what that is. But primarily though, what I am and what I used to be is I'm a radio guy. I have all kinds of different radio experience. So when I look at Wi-Fi, I look at it from a totally different perspective than 99.9% .9 of the people that I ever run into in this industry. And so I'm all that stuff. Um, yeah. And oh, by the way, I'm also a CWNE. So we'll throw that in at the end. Um, my topic. Many people like to think that they have designed Wi-Fi in the worst RF in the world, but I can promise you, I can promise you that I've done it in the worst possible scenario. That is a direct quote from my submission, and you all bought it and clicked on it. So keep in mind, this is all your fault. <laughs> but first, we've got to define what is the worst RF. And this is a conversation that I've had many and many times, and no one's been able to do it. I mean, you know, 80 megahertz wide channels not using the right antennas. You know, Phil was talking about that earlier and stole half of my presentation. So I'm gonna be done in like, <laughs> maybe it's Sean, you know, and going, hey, they're running 80 megahertz wide. And then, they, oh, they got channels one, three, four, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and got to call out my own. That is channel fly. Cause if you look down there at the bottom, that says ruckus. <laughs> so somebody misconfigured channel fly. Maybe that's the worst one. Or Chris. This happened, Chris is, actually came from the same airport that I was complaining about, but he complained about it for a different, because he's like, oh, this is bad fi. Thanks, Eddie. Um, <laughs> basically made the first half of my presentation. But if you look, it's like, maybe the RF's not too bad, but he had poor user experience. So is it a bad RF? I don't know. Um, Jim Bata, this is actually from this past summer. And I asked him if I could use this, and he said, yeah, sure. And I said, well, I'm going to use it not how you think. You know, because here he is in you know, July of 2022, and he's at a hotel that's running 802.11G. It's recently remodeled. How could they do that? How could they think about doing that? Oh wait, it wasn't bad RF because he streamed 4K video all night and it was still going strong. So maybe, well, I, I don't know, what is it? Maybe it's Kevin and you know, it's 2.4 guys running 40 megahertz wide channels at his house. Is that the worst? I don't know, maybe. Uh, maybe it's event Wi-Fi, like DEF CON from a couple of years ago. This is uh, you know, a capture from Wi-Fi Explorer. Is that the worst? I don't know. Maybe it was Black Hat. You know, and this was the 552 wireless networks that I picked up in a 60-second scan down on the, on the show floor. And that's when I learned that after COVID, everybody bought their own TVs to display. And they all have Rokus in them. And when they turn them all on at the exact same time, right before the expo hall opens, they all beacon out at the exact same time. And if you have you know, any type of auto channel, it just goes crazy. So I don't know, maybe it's that. Maybe it's my house. I mean, not my house. I mean, because my house is right here at Uni2 all by itself. You know, but my neighbors, you know, one and three, they're kind of hosed. Um, maybe it's us. Maybe we cause it. Well, I mean, not we, because if you look down here at the bottom, this was February. So this was the Phoenix guys, not the, not the Prague. Prague wouldn't do this, this is Phoenix. So we gotta fix that. The other possibility is maybe it's clients. So Sam's gonna talk about this in a little bit, about Slack. Now this was a conversation from the Wi-Fi Pro Slack um, from this past July. And if you look, I actually state, I'm going to attempt a 55 minute presentation in Prague and this entire thing is gonna go included. Now you might look, it says 16 pages when I copied it out. It, they just started talking and it went on and on. It went on some more and then it kept going and I went, wait a second, this isn't gonna fit. So then I had to decrease the font and then I went, well, okay, now we gotta go double pages. And it just kept going and going and going and going. And then finally after 16 pages, it was done. Now, I brought you along this journey because actually there was a point. There really was a point. It took us three days and a lot of stuff. But the first point came from the IT rebel, which is Scott Lester. And Scott said, we spend too much time focusing on being precise in an imprecise world. And believe it or not, Daniel says, good point. He says, we spend too much time trying to find a single answer for all scenarios in a world full of chaos. 
And then Scott came back and said, I agree. And I went, holy Moses, somebody on the Wi-Fi Pro Slack agreed. Of course, then Jason came back and went, well, I'd argue. Now, what Jason's arguing, I don't know if he's arguing that they agreed or something else, but we'll get back to Jason later. So there it is. Thanks for coming to my 10 talk. I'm all done. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, let me go back to this slide. Many people think that they have designed Wi-Fi in the worst RF in the world. But I can promise you I've done it. Well, how can I make this statement? Right? I just spent, oh, it doesn't show up on this slide, but I just spent about 30 some odd slides proving that we can't, we don't know. It's too hard to say. Now, the reason why I can say this is because we've all done it. I know I've done it because I've designed Wi-Fi. And I know that everybody else has done it because guess what? You've designed Wi-Fi as well, right? So we've all done this. Now the thing is, is when you talk about the worst RF, you have to think about it from project to project because it's not fair to compare the RF in this hotel to the RF in a hotel across town because guess what? They don't care. You get about 150 feet, you know, 200 feet outside the perimeter of the property, they don't care what the RF is over there. They, want to, they care about the RF in their facility. They want to solve that. So for the customer, that is the worst RF in the world. We don't have to compare this hotel to some other hotel to you know, Jim Vada's 11G network. We don't have to compare those things because it's pointless. We spend too much time arguing about this stuff when what we need to focus on is we need to figure out how do we design for the customer at hand, for the project at hand? How do we fix that issue and stop trying to compare this issue to that issue because it's pointless? So after my 10 talk, or I guess it's more like a talk, um, I'm gonna switch this over. And we're, not gonna, we're gonna talk about the fact that designing Wi-Fi is a challenge just in and of itself, but there are tricks. There are tricks that I've kind of learned from a lot of my experience you know, prior to Wi-Fi and this stuff in Wi-Fi. And so I've come up with Jim's tips for designing Wi-Fi. Now the first tip that I have actually comes from CWMP and CWSP. And it's an organizational radio frequency standard. Now before you all jump on Twitter and start mocking me and say, bleh, bleh, let me, yeah, Eddie, stop. <laughs> let me, we're gonna talk about this one and then after we talk about it, then you can get on Twitter and mock me. The second one comes from Jake Snyder have firmly held beliefs that you are willing to change. You got a good story about that one. The third one comes from science, because accuracy matters to a point. I don't know if you can see that shirt. It says E equals MC squared plus or minus 3 dB. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one comes from John's Daphne Tennessee Whiskey. All things are not created equal. Now, I didn't know Sam was gonna be here when I put this slide in, but this is stuff that I cannot make up. I actually found this searching online. There is this drink that you can buy in China about, it's called John's Daphne Tenderness Whiskey. <laughs> now they're not even sure of the thing, you know, they're not, they're not even, it might kill you, but this is, exists. This stuff actually exists. I had, to, I, I found it in like a couple different things and I was like, and then I, then I found out Sam was gonna be here and I was like, oh yes, we gotta leave this in for Sam. But, <laughs> so if you ever see Sam drinking John's Daphne, we, the world's about to end, we have problems. So, all right, sorry about that. Uh, the last one, uh, the tip I have, is trust yourself. Now, there's a lot more tips, but I ran out of space with my circles, and I'm gonna run out of time, so we're just gonna stick with five for now. So the first one we're gonna talk about is an organizational radio frequency standard. Now, before I get started, I need to throw this little caveat in here. I am not a lawyer, let me read this. I'm not a lawyer and nothing I state here should be construed as legal device. To learn more about it was legal in your area, please consult with the appropriate legal representation for your area. Now, I will also tell you, the other thing you can do is just find a lawyer who will argue on your behalf. I once had um, an attorney that told me that it was okay for me to turn off a captive portal. And then a couple months later, I had a different attorney to tell me I was going to jail for doing it. So it's not, <laughs> that legal thing can be a little gray. So all you need to do is really find an attorney who agrees with you and go to court and argue for you. <laughs> because what's legal can kind of be gray. Now, this all comes from this idea about unlicensed. But unlicensed doesn't mean unregulated. And there's a difference here, right? Because Wi-Fi runs an un unlicensed frequency. It's not like you gotta go buy it. And we'll talk about license here in a second. But we still have regulations like CSMACA, which really translates to, you know, listen before you transmit. Now, later, you know, 
this afternoon, you know, we're all going to, there's some of us are going to be playing around with little handheld radios. Well, this is the first thing you learn when you get radios is before you mash this button on the side and start transmitting, listen, listen before you transmit. And we have that with CSMACA. We don't just get to randomly go and just transmit whenever because there's some regulations there. Maximum transmit power. It's unlicensed. Why do I have a maximum transmit power? I want a thousand watt AP that I can throw up and cover an entire city. That won't work, but that's what I want. I'm just, I work for a vendor and I can't even get it. And why not 30 megahertz channels? You know, we have 20, which gives us three, but why can't we do, you know, 30 and get, you know, a little bit more bandwidth per channel 2.4 because that way, you know, we almost can fit it, but why not? Why don't we have this stuff? It's unlicensed, but it's not unregulated. And so we need to make sure that we, we keep that in mind when we start talking about this stuff is there is a difference between unlicensed and unregulated. Because even when we start talking about licensed frequencies, like I used to deal with back in my past, where you would actually go to your country's, you know, coordinating committee in the U.S., it's the FCC, and at you have all these, uh, every, you know, have their own thing. But even when you license a frequency and you pay that money and they give you this frequency and they go, here, this is yours, even though you pay for it, you still have regulations on it because near field interference is an electromagnetic physics issue. It's not a right, it's not a privilege, it's literally physics. Now, if you don't know what near field is, what that means is if I key this thing up and it's running at you know, 150 megahertz and I put it right next to Ben's wireless mic, it, <laughs> it's, it's still off, I haven't turned it on yet. <laughs> but if I were to do that, even, even though there are wildly different frequencies running different modulation schemes, if I can get this radio close enough to that antenna and it's in my pocket, it's going to jam it no matter what I do because it's a physics issue. Intermodulation studies. I don't know if anybody knows what an intermodulation is or what intermod is, um, is if when you have one transmitter and you take a second transmitter that are on two different frequencies, and, but if they're in the wrong frequencies and they're close enough together, what'll happen is they'll mix together and create a third unintended frequency that's separate of the other two. Now these are just electromagnetic physics issues. These are things that go back to James Clerk Maxwell in the 1850s, right? You can't regulate these things. I mean, we have building and electrical codes because as much as I want to stomp my feet up and down and say, I'm going to build a house in the Alps that has a perfectly flat roof, there's codes there that say you can't do that, even though you might have a right, you know, because if you do it for a snowstorm, the thing's going to collapse and kill everybody on the inside. So we don't get to do this stuff just willy-nilly just because, oh, you know, it's unlike that we still live within all these other th um, parameters. And then when we even look at organizations, they have policies. You know, when you sign, you know, when you join a company, you sign that little, you know, well, not little anymore, the big giant packet of papers from HR that you agreed to, you know, sign your life away and everything else. But one of the things you could sign away is your ability to have a personal phone. There's some organizations, some facilities you go to where you're not even allowed to carry your personal phone. Well, how can they do that? You know, you can't plug in your own AP. Why not? It's unlicensed. I should be able to do all that stuff. You know, and they have these cybersecurity policies that say, oh yeah, you can't do your own AP. And when you look at the CWSP, you know, parameters, I mean, it literally ties together. It says, hey, before you start doing your CWSP and your wireless security stuff, you need to have a policy. That way you know what to build. This stuff is already there. We already have these frameworks that exist in organizations. And so what I'm talking about is building an, R an organizational RF standard. And if you get people to agree to it, to sign it onto it, just like you know, I bought a house and it has an, a homeowners association and it says that I can't put up a flagpole. Why not? Well, because I agreed that I would abide by the rules when I moved into my house. So I don't get to have these, you know, it's not just a free for all, but the way you work this is you need to first understand the use cases, understand what people could possibly want to do in these things and start building these um, policies that say, hey, how do, we, how do we define this stuff? You know, channel widths. Don't say you can't stand up an AP. Say, hey, if you need to stand up an AP, work with us and let's figure out what channel width you need. I had a customer, well, my last job, we had a tenant who decided that their evening shift manager's son knew a lot about IT, so they went to Best Buy and they bought their own you know, little router and they stood the thing up and they were running 80 megahertz wide and just jamming the crap out of everything in my, in my network. And I went down and I said, what are you doing with this thing? And they went, oh, they said, we had this YouTube video that we stream to one device and we need 80 megahertz wide. And I said, no, you don't. And they went, well, the guy, you know, the afternoon manager's son said we do. And that's what we're stuck with because 
you know, unfortunately in the in our organizational RF standards, they didn't say you can't run 80 megahertz wide channel. So now they could. They had to ask us, hey, can we put it in? And we went, oh yeah. And we said, will you please not run 80? And they went, well, no, it doesn't say we don't have to. So we're gonna run 80s and jam everything. You know, some devices, you know, don't even run in Uni 2 or Uni 1 or you 5 gigahertz. Had somebody bought a brand new phone and they went, yeah, we're giving it to all the janitors and it wouldn't connect. And so I started trying to do um, Profiler off the WLAN Pi and it turns out, well, they actually don't support 5 gigahertz. It's 11 and, but it's still 2.4. You know, so you have to understand all this stuff so you can start building these policies and, and start planning for this stuff so that when you have these multi-tenancy organizations and facilities, you know, have a policy in place that says, hey, you can, you know, let's work together because, you know, the, the, what you want to do is build a service that they want to use. We talk about it all the time, like, I'll just stand up my hotspot. Well, why do you stand up a hotspot? You stand up the hotspot because of what Chris Reed was talking about, poor user experience, but he blamed BadFi. Why the, the RF was fine, but he's still saying, oh, this is BadFi because he had poor user experience. That's why Chris stood up his hotspot. You know, and Jim didn't. Jim was running 11G, 20 megahertz wide channel, but it still worked for him. So he said, I'm not gonna stand up my hotspot. So if you build a service that they wanna use within the standard and you work together, you can actually come up with you know, a policy to keep from having to design in the worst RF in the world because you've agreed to coexist and build a network that works for everybody. Because it's fun to talk tough. You know, oh, I'll just de-auth them all. I'll turn on my WIDs and WIPs and I'm just gonna jam the crap out of them. We're gonna knock them all off. Because it's really fun to talk about that. But it's more effective to just talk about and agree to coexist. It's more effective. It reduces a lot of heartache from us. And this is actually a quote from my buddy John Deegan, Wi-Fi John. He told me that like two weeks ago and I was like, ooh, I'm stealing that. Because it is. It's fun to talk tough. But at the end of the day, it's more effective to just talk and agree to coexist because we can do it as long as we have these policies that we can say, hey, this is how we're going to coexist together. So hopefully, okay, now you can go to Twitter and complain about everything I just said about that. So Jake, have fir firmly held beliefs that you are willing to change. Now, funny story about this. I swear up and down that Jake said this. Jake swears up and down that Jake never said this. And both of us are not willing to change on that approach. <laughs> But I, I like this because we all have beliefs. We all have these things that we've learned over time. Oh, I need to have, you know, dual band SSIDs, you know. But over time, you realize that, well, these beliefs can change. And why do they change? Well, you know, some of the beliefs I had was band-specific SSIDs. I needed to have a 5 gigahertz band or SSID, and I needed to have a 2.4, and we're going to call it slow until one day I realized that like half of my users were just clicking on the slow one, and they would never connect to my 5 gig. And so I looked in a room one time, there's 10 devices, and all of them were reporting the latest iPhone, and they were all on 2.4. And I turned off 2.4, and they all jumped to 5 because they'd never actually selected the fast SSID. They selected the slow and that's what their device remembered. So after talking to Jake and we argued back and forth for, I don't know, 18 months, I finally went, yes, Jake, you are right. And I switched and said, I'm gonna agree with you on that one. I used to think that MAB was an effective security option. And Phil's gonna teach it in your uh, deep dive, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I used to think you didn't need to mess with the minimum basic rate. I'd be like, that's ah, the one thing you don't mess with. Just leave that there. Yeah, that, that actually that changed my idea. Changed my mind on that one. Now, I used to also think that I needed to adjust every nerd knob that was available. You know, but then I learned that Wi-Fi works in spite of us, not because of us. And I just went, I went, wait a second, maybe I just need to adjust the ones that I really need to adjust. And so these are all beliefs that I have changed over time. And again, and, it, and you do this because Wi-Fi is part science. Now, if you've done this long enough, you also know that Wi-Fi is also part art. It's part art, it's part science, but we're gonna talk about the science part right now. Because we come up with a hypothesis and we go, okay, this is what I think I need to do. I think that the problem is, you know, we were working on the, the air tunnel upstairs and, and it was like, oh, we think we're encroaching on the Fresnel zone. So we came up with a hypothesis. And of course, what we would normally do in science is you would then, you know, come up with an experiment and you're gonna like, I'm gonna test this and we're gonna, oh God, no, what am I talking about? No, we just put it straight into production and we just go, we're gonna test in prod, right? So yeah, we're kind of not really scientists, but we kind of are. And sometimes it works. Yeah, we get the dance. 
and sometimes it doesn't, and we have a flaming dumpster fire. Now, the science part of this is we say, okay, let's take what we learned from this. We're going to put it back up into our hypothesis and then run it through our, you know, our test environment, our lab. Now we put it right back into production again, and sometimes, you know, we get our dancing guy again because that's fun. But now we have to go through the dumpster fire many, many times. And that's where we, our beliefs change over time is because we've all ridden the flaming dumpster fire down the flooded street. I mean, what is it? You, you know, if you've never crashed a production network, are you really a network engineer? You know, if, you, <laughs> if, you've, never, if you've never, you know, never put the, you know, switch port VLAN or switch, tr switch port mode or trunk VLAN and you, you know, and you forget the ad, you know, and then you do the, the, the sprint of death carrying, you know, your laptop and a serial cable trying to run to the closet before your boss realizes that you've isolated a switch. And we've all ridden the dumpster fire, right? But the, and so that's how we learn. And so as we learn, as we kind of go through this stuff, Realize that we've all learned this stuff through trial and error, through riding the dumpster fire, through our dances, you know, you get that ping to work or the, the light changes colors and you're just like, yes. And people look at you and go, well, so what? The ping works. What's the big deal? It's just a ping. And you're like, you don't know because we've ridden the dumpster fire. We know what it takes to get that. So know what you know, but also know what you don't know. Now, I actually don't like the way that reads, but it, it all fits together in my bullet points. What, really what that should say is understand that you don't know everything. Because while you've ridden the dumpster fire, you haven't ridden the same dumpster fire as all the people in this room. And that's what's great about the Wi-Fi Pro Slack. So you know, don't avoid it because of what I showed earlier. But you know, that's where we come together as a community is when you understand that you, know, you might not know everything because somebody else might have ridden this, a dumpster fire, but it's a different dumpster fire. So. That's where we get to Daniel. And it, you know, we spend too much time trying to find a single answer for all scenarios in a world full of chaos. I mean, almost every presentation that you're going to hear you know, over the next three days is all going to be talking about, oh, this different this and, and this scenario here and this that. And that's how we learn is by, you know, instead of sitting here going, I know what I know, you know, know what you know, but also when you're presented with a good argument or something, be willing to change it because that's how you get better. So science, accuracy matters. Plus or minus 3 dB is an old radio thing. I've, talking, I've talked to many different radio people, two people I actually considered experts and they would never, never admit to it. But every time I talked to these radio experts, they'd always tell me like, well, just get me within plus or minus 3 dB. And, and for a lot of us, we go, what, what do you mean plus or minus 3 dB? That's huge. Well, the problem is RF is never stable. Too many times we're lulled into this sense of RF is this really stable thing because of the tools we use. And these tools look at the beacon frames and they go, okay, I saw the beacon frame here, right? But then your tool goes and scans something else. Unless you have the coconut that's scanning you know, all the channels all the time. And then you'll see that thing, you'll see that level change because RF isn't stable and fluctuations happen all of the time. Now, what am I talking about? This is a screenshot from an Agilent Spectrum Analyzer. There is no pistachio Oreos, Eddie, so you're just gonna have to, you know, come take a picture of something else. But what we're looking at here is basically just sort of the, the noise floor that lives down here, right? Now, if you zoom into that, let's see if I can zoom in here, what you'll notice is that thing just jumps all over the place. Now, the reason why it does this is when you set up a spectrum analyzer, you have three different modes. You have a live mode, you have an average, and you have like, you'll have like a max hold, right? Now, if you really want to know the noise floor, what you do is you put it on average and you let the thing run for a couple of minutes. And that all those you know, jaggedy points will actually level out over time because it gives you an average noise floor. But in reality, when you take a look at this thing, you know, it's, it, it jumps all over the place. I mean, look at these spikes and these valleys within this noise floor, and that's when you, and for, can't see in the back, this, each one of these gradients is 30 megahertz wide. That's how wide this, this is. It goes from 2.4 to 2.7, which means that when you think about a 20 megahertz wide channel, you know, you're living in two thirds of this one little square and you can see all those fluctuations in the noise. And then this is where you get the idea of as you double your bandwidth, you double your noise floor and stuff like that because you're looking at more and more spectrum. And as you look at more, that noise flow will raise up. 
the signal fluctuates too. Now this is Wi-Fi signal from Adrian, or two of bits, or I can never pronounce that. And I took a couple of these screenshots within just a couple seconds on my new hotness network. And what you might notice is the signal level fluctuates. And this was all within about 10 seconds, just as fast as I could you know, do a screen scrape. And you can see that I went from a neg 51 to a neg 48 to a neg 46. And that's just what it was seeing you know, within there. So it fluctuates, but neg 51 to neg 46 is five dB difference. So that even violates my rule of plus or minus three dB. Because when you try to track this stuff, now the noise doesn't change. And the signal to noise changes a lot because we're seeing a signal change. And I also find it interesting that the excellent one has, you know, the, the um, it's just MCS of eight. So anyway, fun stuff, but it, there's all these fluctuations, right? So trying to narrow it down and be like, it's gonna be exactly this is impossible. So that's why we have the plus or minus three dB. Now, when we think about it, you go plus or minus three dB, that's a lot, right? We know, you know, how many of us have taken CWDP, ECSE, you know, you do the dB math and all that other stuff. When you take a look at a, a plus 20 and you go plus or minus 3 dB, you're looking anywhere from a plus 17 to a plus 23, right? That's a lot. When we actually convert that into milliwatts, you're looking anywhere from 50 milliwatts to 200 milliwatts. And that's a big spread, I'll admit it. But that's a big spread up here up at the ceiling because that's where you're setting the power level for your AP, right? Now, how many people design their networks for what the, what is, how the network's gonna perform at the ceiling? I'm the only one? Nobody? Okay, good, because you're not supposed to design up there. You're supposed to design down here where all your laptops and, and phones are, right? So when we take a look at that and we go, even at a NEG 67, you know, and you go plus or minus 3 dB, because I know NEG 65, but I pick 67 because the math and some other figures. But anyway, neg 67 down here and you go plus or minus 3 dB, it's still a 6 dB swing, right? Plus or minus 3 dB. When we take a look at the wattage on that, here's the, <laughs> took me a long time to do this math, by the way, to get all the zeros right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what you're looking at is you're looking at a neg 67 is 200 picowatts. When you go to a neg 64, that's 400 picowatts. And a neg 70 is 100 picowatt. Now, picowatt is a very, 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 very small amount. We're talking about in the billions of a watt. So when Keith and Eddie and Fernay and all your instructors and you know, Francois and, and all, when, when you're sitting in these classes and they talk about dB math, you're talking about a billionth change of a watt down here or you know, a hundred, you know, hundred billionths of a change. It's so infinitesimal that you can't detect it. So instead of trying to be everything so exact, Give yourself a little bit of space because we even have to do that with installers, right? Never underestimate installers. You need to give them that plus or minus 3 dB as well. Because if you can imagine how an installer is gonna screw up your, your network, they will. They, if you can think of it, they will screw it up. Um, if you can't think of it, they will still screw it up. With unexperienced installers, actual accuracy matters to a point. Because if you take an unexperienced installer and you say, I need to put the AP right there, and they come in and there's a, there's a light there, they'll just, get, they'll just be like, oh crap, now what do we do? So they go find you, they drag you down here, and you go, why don't you just put it right there? You know, so give them a little bit of space, you know, but make sure that you give them the right space. Because if you give them the wrong space, they'll be like, oh, well, we can move it. So we're gonna move it you know, right next to the projector. We're gonna put it on top of the projector. So it accuracy, accuracy matters, but to a point. Don't dismiss experienced installers either. I've had some installers that once I got them trained up, these guys saved my bacon all the time because they knew that accuracy matters to a point, but they knew what point I cared about. They knew where they could fudge. They could be like, oh, you know, I can't put the AP here, but I can put it right over here. Oh, I can't put it there because there's too many lights. What if we move it? And so you don't underestimate them because they know how and where they can adjust. And when they finally get to the point where they're like, I'm stumped, when they come and get you, when they call you and say, we have a problem, you go down there, a lot of times you go, oh yeah, that's a good one. Well, let me think about this. Where are we gonna put this? And so don't underestimate a good installer. And how do you make a good installer? I, on, CWT is a great place. I know we, you know, we're CWNE, CWNE, C you know what? CWT, I've run some people through it. 
I've had my installers go through it, and it's fantastic. So you can train your own installer. So I'm gonna talk about Murphy's Law of Wi-Fi design real quick. I used to be in the military, and we had a thing called Murphy's Law of Combat. Murphy's Law of Combat stated that no good plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. Well, Jim's Murphy's Law of Wi-Fi design says no good Wi-Fi design ever survives first contact with the installers. <laughs> so be, be, be flexible and don't try to hold everybody to a point because you know we spend too much time focusing on being precise in an imprecise world. So know where you can adjust, how you can adjust, and it will, and it will just make everything so much better. Sorry, Eddie, I'll show, send you the deck later. <laughs> Look, I got 14 and a half minutes. I don't get, I don't, I'm not like you, I can't go over. So all things are not created equal. <laughs> I love you, Eddie. Um, this is things that I've learned over time. Internal antenna AP patterns are not the same. And Phil touched on this, so Phil's gonna correct me on everything I'm gonna say next. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about an enterprise AP. Now this is just a random enterprise AP that I, you know, I found somewhere online. Some of you might recognize it, some of you might know. But anyway, let's talk about what's in here. We have dual band antennas, we have four of them. Then coming up, we have some five gigahertz antennas. They're all kind of laid out kind of nice and pretty like that, right? Now we're not done because we also have a 2.4 gigahertz IoT antenna that's talked about further on the side. And then we're still not done because then we have a ninth, eight, ten. We have a tenth antenna that's right there in the middle and it's doing a scanning, receiving only thing type of thing. Now, when you take all of these antennas, and that's all they are, just antennas. I mean, you see the little chunks of metal and stuff like that. When you take those things and you look at the polar charts that Phil was talking about, this is what it looks like. Now, what you might notice, and Phil kind of touched on it, and I'm going to throw you something else, and then Phil and I are gonna meet in the bar and slug it out. Um, <laughs> what we're looking at here is the elevation, because from, a, from the azimuth, or the horizontal, it is a 360. But if you notice, the elevation isn't quite. This is what's known as a semi-hemispherical antenna. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but if we take this antenna pattern and we rotate it 180 degrees, and Phil, I know Phil would have done all this if he had time. Um, this is what it looks like when you install it right? It's hanging there on the ceiling. You know, you have more signal that's actually pointing down here where we need it, where we want it, because we designed down here, not uh, at the ceiling or above the ceiling. And so that's how you sort of get that thing. That's semi-hemispherical. And if we, if I rotate this thing again for you and keep rotating it, you can kind of see how, you know, that signal pattern is really offset. It's lopsided and we want it like that. Now, if you take a look at an AP that I have access to because, well, I work for Ruckus, this is what it looks like. Now, we have some five gigahertz antenna arrays. These are not elements. These are arrays, so they're specially designed. There's multiple um, antenna elements within the array. And then we have some 2.4 gigahertz arrays. Now, these arrays make a big difference because when we take these and we space them on a board, and then we throw in a couple of uh, some actual antenna elements, and we have some five gigahertz here, and then we have some dual band antennas here. Now when you take these things and you stack them all together and you get them spaced the right way, and we're gonna play with this actually in the deep dive tonight, um, what you end up with is, remember here's our enterprise AP. We take this pattern and we look at it from a, the ruckus AP. It's still that semi-hemispherical, and we rotate this. So now they're both hanging on the ceiling and we're designing down here, but what you'll notice is that they're actually quite different in the way that these patterns exist, right? And then when we compare them side by side, you know, you can say, you're like, wow, this is really different, but how much different? How much different does it really make? I'm gonna highlight the 20 dB downline. Bill was talking about all that stuff, so I don't have to. Um, but what you notice is on the ruckus one, on the back lobes, on that back side, it's really pulled in tight. I mean, we're, when we take a look at this point, on the other one, it's five dB more. It's outside my plus or minus three dB. And we take a look at those 60 degree marks, we're 10 dB out. I mean, we're 10 dB hotter at that point up there, which means we're losing 10 dB of our signal above the ceiling panel. So you have this great signal in that space between the, the drop ceiling and the floor plan, floor plan, pan, but 
we don't design up there. Now, when you take those arrays and you put them in there and you space them, it changes the pattern. And what that does is it takes the center part, usually go below the floor, and it pulls it up. It also then takes those lobes and it pushes them out to the side. And so you end up with this donut that hangs below the, end, below the AP. But when we take a look at it, the other one is sort of hanging down there. So when you talk about APs, you know, and it's like, oh, they're internal antenna AP, internal antenna AP, same, same, not really. There are differences. And it's the same for external antenna, high XL techs. Um, <laughs> these are not created equal. Now, what I'm, I'm, this is not vendor bashing. What I'm trying to show here is that there are different external antenna assemblies. We're gonna see this tomorrow in my deep dive. I stole a lot of it from my deep dive. Um, this is an omnidirectional antenna. You can see the, um, the three little elements right there and there's nothing around it. So that was an omni, but it was actually a single element. It's just one little thing. That's a valid antenna. Now, is it good quality? Uh, 15, 20 years ago maybe, but not today. Um, here's the same thing where they said, we're gonna turn it into a directional. So they just put the backplane on it. You got the driven element. Yeah, then you got, you know, there's your driven element there. There's your, uh, it's just space. So these are your, you know, your different elements. Now it's, a, now it's a Yagi. Now what you're gonna get off of this pattern is wholly unknown because no one put it in a chamber. <laughs> But today we look at different antennas and they come in different things. We have the printed circuit board antenna. We also have things where they're metal element antennas. And now they're going to behave and perform differently even though, yeah, they're different shapes, but the way they perform when you install them are gonna be different. Maybe you want the printed circuit board antenna. Maybe you want the metal element antenna. I don't know. What's your design requirements? We design to the requirements, not design to whatever we you know, just dream up at night. So you have to pay attention to that stuff because you know, even if you notice on those, those two patch antennas, coax cable isn't the same. Now, what do I mean by that? We all know that there's free, free space path loss, right? Now, how many people knew that cable attenuation was a thing? It is. You know, we take a look at um, like LMR 100 right up here, the top line, this blue line right here. LMR 100 is really nice cable. It's super thin, it's super flexible, it can go anywhere. But when you look at like the, our brand new six gigahertz frequency, at 100 feet of LMR 100, you're looking at about 65 dB of loss. So it's great, it's nice and small and tiny. And if you put 10 feet of that, you're gonna lose six and a half dB just to get between your AP and your antenna. Now, if you go look down here at the bottom, this stuff called LDF4, and if you come find me, I have a sample of this. This stuff is half inch hard line. It actually doesn't have a braided outside ground as a solid copper jacket. But that loss is fantastic. At six gigahertz at 100 feet, four dB, it's fantastic. Now the problem is it's this big around, you can't pull it through conduit to save your life. And the bend radius is about 24 inches to do a 90 degree turn. So you have to ask yourself, what is it do I need? Because the one thing I learned actually in Phoenix is the, the planning tools actually don't incorporate the cable loss when they put up the antenna patterns. So if you go to the antenna makers and you say, hey, I need, a, I need you know, this four element antenna and I need 20 foot leads and I want LMR 100, they're gonna laugh at you because they're, and they're never gonna build it because they know it's not gonna work because the planning tools don't actually incorporate that cable loss. But once you know that, and once you learn about all this stuff, then when you do it, you can design it right, because you go, ah, I gotta account for that six dB of loss because I'm doing this. And then you go higher gain, you change power levels, there's different things you can do. And so, now that we know all this stuff, we can quit early and finish off this bourbon, you know, this bottle of bourbon, and hopefully it's the good stuff that Sam brings, and not John's Daphne. Now Jason here is arguing that that's a job of an SME. And at this point, I think what he's arguing is that the job of an SME is to drink the bourbon at 9 a.m. So now, when your bosses ask you, why are you drinking bourbon at 9 a.m., you can say, well, Jason said that he agreed. Or he argued that that was our job and that's what we should be doing. So the last thing. No? Don't? Oh, you did. <laughs> okay, we're back on the slack. Um, <laughs> trust yourself, all right? I get this all the time. We are all not PhDs in physics. 
I've met two guys, and I've told some stories about one of the guys here. Absolute amazing genius guy. I mean, the guy was, well, he, he was in the room when they turned the JK flip-flop on. You know, so if you don't know what a JK flip-flop is, go look it up and then realize that I worked with a guy who was in the room when it was turned on for the first time. It's actually the birth of modern electronics. And I, and I was talking to this guy and I said, I said, and I asked him very specifically and I said, are you an RF expert? And he looked at me and he said, I would never ever say that. And I said, well, why not? I said, why not, Vern? I said, I said, you were there at the birth of modern electronics. And he said, he said, well, he said, I know a lot about RF. And he goes, but every time I learn stuff about RF, he goes, I also learned that there's a lot more that I don't know and don't understand. Because, you know, RF is part of the art of designing Wi-Fi. You know, understanding how this stuff works together. So don't feel bad if you go, well, you know, I'm not a, I don't have a doctorate in physics. I don't under, no, because you know what? Even the guys who do, even have the guys who, you know, wrote the stuff that built the standards, you know, um, you know, they're not even PhDs. And even if they are, they'll tell you, I don't know nearly enough to call myself an expert. So don't feel bad if you're not a PhD. Don't feel bad if you don't understand RF the way I do, because I can always look around and I'll show you 50 guys, 100 guys, 200 guys that know more than me. You know, I learned something the other day when I was looking it up for my class. Um, who knows who Heinrich Hertz is? Really? Right, there's not enough hands for people. Did you know that Heinrich Hertz is where we named, that's where the term Hertz came from. He proved James Clerk Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. He died when he was 37 years old from complications and surgery, but he still died at 37. And I thought to myself, man, I am older than 37. I am nowhere near as accomplished as Heinrich Hertz. But don't feel bad because we're, not, we're all not there because expert really is a loaded word. The more you learn about Wi-Fi, the more you learn about RF, the more you learn about networking, the more you learn that you don't know, and the more you learn that you have to learn more. Was it the Dunning-Kruger effect? So don't feel bad because, I mean, I'm gonna stand up in an hour and I'm gonna teach a deep dive to a room of 30 people, and I'm still not sure why they signed up to take my class. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, you guys should, it's like, let's trade places. Let's put 30 people in the road. I'm gonna sit down there. Because expert really is a loaded word. I look at it from the, the aspect of martial arts. They say that when you get your black belt, it's not the end of the journey. What they say when you have, get your black belt in martial arts is you finally know enough to start your journey. So when you get your CWNE, when you get to call yourself a certified wireless networking expert, all that means is you now know enough so that when Peter McKenzie talks, you can go, oh, I know the right question to ask because I still don't know as much as Peter. And Peter tells me, he goes, I wanna take your class because I don't know as much as you. So expert is a loaded word. And I'm here to tell you, you are going to make mistakes. How many people here have done a network, done a design, and they go back five, two, the next year, and you look at it and you go, I can't believe they paid me for that. <laughs> and you're just like, you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> Everybody does it. You will make mistakes. Don't feel bad, you know, because you are going to ride the dumpster fire and then you're gonna do the dance when you figure it out and you're gonna be all happy and your wife's gonna look at you and go, you're nuts. <laughs> but you're all gonna do it because you are going to get better. You will get better. I promise you that you are going to get better. Why? Because you're here. You know, we come together so that we can all get better. I can learn more about, you know, packet analysis from Peter, and Peter can learn more about antennas from me. That's why we're here. So you've taken the first step. So now trust yourself, or the 18th step or 14th. How many WLPCs? A lot. Yeah, so some of you taking a lot of steps, <laughs> and we're still making mistakes, and we're still going to get better. Because many people like to think that they have designed Wi-Fi in the worst RF in the world, but I can promise you that I have done it in the worst possible scenario. Now I want to change this just slightly because we all have, we have all done it, all of us together. And that's why I can make that statement because I'm part of the community and we've all done it. So thank you. Yeah.